It's a pleasure to be here. I feel a deep gratitude to be here at a place like MCC. It's always inspiring coming to any kind of Muslim community for me because a community like this is a community that is focused around what is really the purpose and the mission for all of us in this life, which is our connection to Allah, connecting to Him and growing in that relationship. And so it's always an inspiration to, to be within, within any kind of Muslim community, a community of people working on that overall mission, and working on promulgating and spreading, inviting others into that mission in general. And it's especially inspiring being here at MCC too. Such a beautiful space, mashallah. It's gotten even more beautiful and more excellent since I was here the last time 10 years ago, alhamdulillah, when I used to give khutbahs. But also not only the space, but everything that's going on here. I mean, alhamdulillah, what a blessing to have in the next room a khatm quran like real engagement with Qur'an here, a real engagement with, with scholarship, with study, with spirituality, and on a level which I know many of you here, all of you as a community, are working on making this accessible in many ways too. One of the things I'm impressed by at MCC is the real striving to make this a disability accessible community as well. That's incredibly inspirational as well as your, your stand on trying to make things environmentally friendly and, and all of the goals that you have here at, at this community. It's, it's really, it's an inspiration to be here. And so I'm here almost to, to, to take benefit from all of you <laughs> in this space and be here. And, and also too, I'm not forgetting anyone who might be watching online as well your intentions, even though you're not physically with us in this space, still your intentions and in showing up virtually too, that's inspirational for me. So thank you for being with us here today. So I'm here for myself. <laughs> I'm here for you as well, because my point in being here today is to help expand and improve this, this mission and this call that all of us feel as Muslims and to really make it as practical as we possibly can, as actionable as we possibly can. I'm also here for the people of Gaza and for all of our oppressed brothers and sisters throughout the world. The people of Gaza are suffering and others, suffering under oppression, under violence, under threats and persecution, because someone seeks to gain from that. Were it not that someone could make money off of this oppression, or gain power off of this oppression, or gain a more comfortable life, or some kind of privilege, we wouldn't see this happening in the world. And this is the natural result of what goes on outside of these walls. What's happening outside of the masjid. The general culture of cultivating in people in the society a sense that our mission in life is to get that money, is to get power, is to have a comfortable life. Unless we have engagement with traditional religion like this, and particularly with Islam, you take uh, what our general culture teaches you, and this is what you get from it. And ultimately the oppression and everything we're seeing, that's the end result, the devaluing of human life, in pursuit of the profit and power for a few. So I sincerely believe that if we can work on our individual and collective sense of purpose a little more effectively, we can start building a movement and creating societal change that will cause lasting effects of bringing more justice to our world and alleviating the oppression of our brothers and sisters throughout the world. That is my hope and that is my belief. And so that's partly why I'm here today. The mission of a community like MCC is inspirational, as I mentioned, and it's inspirational to me. But that mission will continue to remain theoretical, continue to remain hypothetical, until each and every one of us has a sense of you as an individual, what are you doing to contribute to that overall communal mission? 
The communal mission remains hypothetical until you have individuals in the community committing to a specific mission, a specific purpose themselves. Just like how when we seek to connect to Allah, our connection to Allah, our relationship with Him remains theoretical. Our desire to serve Him, our desire for ibadah remains theoretical as long as it is not tied to a specific mission of how we're seeking to serve our fellow humans. And that's why I'm here today. So hopefully what, what I have come here to hopefully provide you, what I'm hoping you can walk away from, from this, this presentation and workshop today with, is a clearer sense of your individual mission, which I sincerely believe from my own personal experience and helping others with this, other things come from as well. Increased motivation, increased self-worth, increased discipline, healthier habits, healthier relationships, and ultimately a stronger and more fulfilling community as a community in which these individuals in the community are connecting on their deep purpose and mission in life. So that's my hope here today. And I speak here too from my own personal experience. So before I was Muslim, I had a pretty shallow mission in life. My, my mission in life was very simple. I wanted one thing in life and that was all that I oriented my life around. I wanted to be an FBI agent. So here on the screen is a picture of me with the then director of the FBI, Robert Mueller, when I was in college. This was my goal, this was my aspiration, that's what I was working towards. And, oh, sorry, I shouldn't, I shouldn't presume that all of you in the room necessarily know all the acronyms that I, might, that I might use in my presentation today. In case you're not aware, FBI is a, a governmental organization. It stands, for, it stands for Funding Bias and Islamophobia. Anyway, before I realized that, this was my aspiration. But when I became Muslim, it took me a few years to realize that I couldn't necessarily keep up that aspiration in a genuine way. I thought for a few years, you know what? Okay, mashallah, I'll be part of the FBI. I'll be, I'll be seeking justice. Ultimately, justice is the name of Allah, so I'm ultimately seeking Allah through this. I'll work that. I'll, I'll do this good work within the institution, and I'll be serving the Muslim community as well. But I quickly realized that I couldn't both serve, the serve this religious and spiritual community that was so dear to me, and at the same time serve this institution which was perpetrating so much discrimination and oppression against this community. It would be like walking into a Biden-Harris rally with a Make America Great Again shirt. It's just not going to work. <laughs> you can't play both. So when I came to that realization, I had to let go of that dream. I had to let go of that unique mission in my life to become an FBI agent. That gave me direction. That gave me a sense of purpose. That gave me a trajectory in my life. I knew exactly what was going to happen, the steps I was going to go to train, to pass the physical test and ultimately pass all the tests I'd had to go through, the polygraph and everything. I knew that, that the trajectory of how to get that position and then ultimately working my way up to be a supervisory special agent and then retiring from that, I could envision the lifestyle that gave me a sense of success. I succeeded in high school, valedictorian in high school, valedictorian in college at my Ivy League institution, now learning Arabic, fluent in Arabic because as my government presented it to me, this was a key key way to understand the counterterrorism threat of our, of our society. And so this propelled me, this gave me a sense of success, but when I lost that, I felt a little lost inside. But I was Muslim, so I said to myself, okay, what do I do want to do with my life? Well, I have a general sense of wanting to serve the community. I have a general sense of wanting to increase my knowledge. And so that's what I did. Alhamdulillah, Allah gave me, blessed me with many opportunities, receiving several ijazas in traditional Islamic sciences, memorizing Quran, Alhamdulillah, with the beloved Qari Amr here, this community, 
May Allah preserve him and reward him for all of the great work that he's doing. Then serving at Zaytuna College, as well as Tatleef Collective. Then in 2014, a friend of mine who had become a professor at Brown University, he sent me an email and said that the Muslim chaplain position at Brown was open. And he said, I haven't seen you apply for it. And my first initial reaction was, hmm. Playing basketball with privileged, know-it-all, annoying college students who reminded me of me, by the way. <laughs> Doesn't really sound like my thing. <laughs> but I was still somewhat inspired by the sense of being able to serve the community in that role. Being able to, to do good things in Rhode Island at Brown University in Providence. And so I applied for the, for the position. Alhamdulillah was... was blessed to, to receive that position and was there for five years. It took the students a while to realize I didn't play basketball. But then after that, when I kind of lost the sense of exactly what I was doing at Brown, because I didn't have specific goals, I was just trying to in general serve the community, I felt like moving on and so I went to a PhD at Harvard. And that's where I am today. And in my first year of Harvard now, this brings us to March of 2020. March of 2020, I'm sitting in my apartment. Everyone else in the house has gone to bed. And I'm, I'm sitting on the floor, leaning against my couch. And I remember the, the musty smell of those old blue carpets. I remember the faint light coming in from, from, from outside. It's a dark night. I remember sitting there, and then a physical sensation started to happen. I felt an itch in my throat. I felt my head start to throb. I felt my stomach start to ache, and my whole body started feeling weak. And I thought to myself, like perhaps a lot of you thought in March of 2020, oh, I think I have COVID. Right? And at that time, before the vaccinations, before we knew anything about COVID, it was just this big terrifying unknown. Once I had that thought, I thought, oh, I think I might be dying. And once I had my reaction to that thought then, following soon after was, okay, I guess it's my time to go. Now, I woke up in the morning, and of course I was fine. I didn't have COVID, or at least if I did, I, my body was able to deal with it. So I was fine in the morning, physically, but spiritually, I wasn't fine. Because something started to build inside of me. I started to feel a kind of righteous anger, a frustration against myself, thinking to where I was that last night, where I had been. Faced with death, ultimately, and how I had reacted. And I started thinking, Adnan, you have a wife who loves you unconditionally. You have a one-year-old son who depends on you. You have a little girl on the way. You have a family to provide for. You still have things to do in this life, and you weren't willing to stand up for that? When confronted with death, you just kind of passively said, okay, I guess it's my time. I was frustrated with myself. I was angry with myself. I thought, okay, we as Muslims, yes, alhamdulillah, we accept the decree of Allah, and if He decrees death on us, we accept that. But still, we need to have a certain zeal, a certain himma, a certain aspiration as well, something we're working for. And I, look, I thought back to that previous night, and I was angry at myself. And so I did one thing. I went to the office in our apartment, to the whiteboard in that office and I wrote in green marker what I wanted to do with my life. I wrote down what my specific mission was. And then over the next few months, even the next few years, life would bring me down. Life would continue to exhaust me. But each time it brought me down, I would return to that mission, I'd return to that whiteboard, I'd revise it until I'd revised it again and again until I had something 
which started to inspire me. Felt like there was something that my life was about, specifically for me. Now, this brings us to September of this year, just a few months ago. I'm in Medina by Senegal. I have an annual habit of going to Senegal and Mauritania to visit teachers there. And as usually happens each year when I go, my northern European body freaks out and says, we're not supposed to be here. And the West African climate freaks out and says, these people aren't supposed to be here. And I get quite sick, as usually happens on this trip when I go. The only thing this time was, it was a short trip, and so the day I got sick was the day before I was supposed to leave, head back and catch my flight to New York. And so I spend a whole day in my bed, can't eat anything, can't drink anything, can't even barely move. I take the advice of my friends, who encourage me to head to the local clinic. So it's now almost midnight. We head to the local clinic. The doctor puts me on an IV. It's now 2 a.m. when the IV has finally, finally trickled down all the way. After that IV, I feel a little more strength. I feel better. And I say to the doctor, I have a flight to catch in the morning. My family needs me. I'm heading home. The doctor takes one look at me and he says, you on flight is no good. I say, no, doctor, no. I, my family needs me. They're expecting me back. My wife, she's just looking after the kids all on her own. I need to be back tomorrow. I am making that flight. So he says, okay. He acquiesces. So here I am now walking out of the clinic. I have my arm around my beloved Senegalese friend, Barham, and we're walking out. It's 2 a.m. now. The streets are still busy and filled with light and, and people and street vendors. It's still popping out there at 2 a.m. in Medina Bay. And so I'm walking, and I make it about half a block away from the clinic, and I start feeling really weird. I don't know what's going on, but I say to Barham, I don't know what's going on. We need to head right back to the clinic right now. So we start turning around. I take a few steps, and then suddenly I start feeling weak. Everything goes black. And I'm in this black space. And in that space, I have one thought. I think, am I dying? Am I dead? Where am I? And as soon as I have that thought, another thought follows it. It says, I have a family to get back to. I have a mission that's not done yet. I still have work to do. And I'm going to fight this. I'm going to crawl my way out of this black space, if I can, possibly. Now, I come to a moment later, and four Senegalese guys, mashallah, may Allah reward them, uh, uh, carrying me one on each limb into the clinic. They bring me back into the bed. I've just had this near-death experience. The doctor comes in to give his prognosis. He takes one look at me, and he says, he's fine. Eat. So it turns out, even though I had experienced it as a near-death experience, I was physically fine, just hadn't eaten or drunk anything the whole day. I just needed some sustenance. But spiritually, it was a profound moment for me because I had something to compare it to. No, that's right. No, it's supposed to be a blank screen. <laughs> <clears throat> because I had something to compare this moment to back in March of 2020 had that moment when I faced death again and I didn't have that motivation I didn't have that drive why didn't I have it because I hadn't defined specifically what I felt like my life was all about it was loosely defined I hadn't worked that out and so this is my message that I want to bring here today to talk about the importance of having that specific mission, having that specific why, if you will. 
And so I'd like to make the case for why you need to have a specific mission that you're all about in this life. One reason is, in the words of Cornel West, a leading philosopher of our time, I am who I am because somebody loved me. That from the moment you are conceived to the moment you're born and then given the food that you need, given the sustenance, given the clothing that you need, given the education that you need, your whole life is a collection of moments and long periods, long, rough, draining periods when other people have sacrificed themselves to make you what you are. Each and every one of us is a product of other people's self-sacrifice. And we know that deep down. We know that in our bones. And we know too that it's not possible to pay that sacrifice back. My mother gave birth to me. I can't mash that. <laughs> There's no way I can pay that back. And if I think about those key people who provided for me in my life after my mother as well and along with her, there's no way I can really bring, pay them back. The only thing I can do in this state, not pay it back, but pay it forward. The only thing that's right for me to do as a human, as someone who acknowledges the human condition, is commit my life to a life of service of others. Of self-sacrifice myself because my life is built and sustained upon the self-sacrifice of others. And yet we live in a culture that makes it hard to accept that and to work on that. We have a culture of entitlement. Many have called it an epidemic of entitlement in our society now. Also, what's going on in our culture? Well, closely related to entitlement is narcissism. College student scores on the narcissist, Narcissism Personality Index have continued to rise since 1979. We're going through a mental health crisis. The CDC estimates that childhood mental health alone costs the US $250 billion a year. And specifically within that, suicide. It's estimated that suicide claims more lives per year than war, murder, and natural disasters combined. And if you took the general life expectancy of each person who makes that what's called forever decision, think about the lives lost that they would have had had they not made that decision to take their life. That's 36 million years of life lost every year. There was just a report in USA Today three days ago that actually said the past year has seen the highest rate of suicides in the US in 80 years. Now, these are sobering statistics, and I know they're statistics the like of which many of you, especially people around at the MCC community, are probably familiar with because I know many of the programs that are on here about Muslim health, about mental health in the Muslim community, and, and that's amazing work and that's inspirational to see. But they're sobering characteristics, but they also demonstrate an opportunity. Because if we, as Muslims, work on our communal mission, backed up by our individual missions, and create a culture of cultivating meaning, both individually and collectively, we can change this. We can move around the society of narcissism. We can give people a real purpose to live, which many, so many, are lacking in this day and age. And to put that all together, Researchers in Japan have actually found this statistically, that people who have a specific reason for being, or ikigai as they call it in Japan, statistically live a longer life. And I'm a product of that. I'm having, I'm also realized that from my personal experience as well. Having had that moment of not having a purpose and not having necessarily something to live for. And yet, then, in that moment of September 2023, facing death again, feeling the encouragement that came and that motivation, that purpose that came from having a specific mission in life. And so now, one of the things that I love to do is to talk about this kind of material 
and make it practical and package it in a way that will provide practical advice, actionable items for all of you to take on and perhaps improve and continue for us all collectively, creating a culture of meaning, both individually and collectively. So this, these lessons I take from my own experience and also my study of the Islamic spiritual tradition. The whole trajectory, the whole program I call Fight for Your Why. Because it's not only essential to know your why, know your mission, your purpose in life, it's essential also to stick up for it and defend it against those forces that want to take it away from you. And now this happens in four steps, as I see it. The first step is to ascertain certain things that are going on. For one, ascertain your why. Find out what that mission and purpose is. As well, get to know who are those enemies out to take your mission away from you. And then to think about not only the why, but the how. Think about all of the well-being in your life. What are the habits and consistent things that you do that support that why as well. Then after the step of ascertain, comes the step unchain. Unchaining ourselves, ridding ourselves of the unhelpful mentalities we have towards how we look at failure or how we make decisions and how we view success. Then after that comes the step of retraining. Retraining ourselves to have the right mindsets, to have the right actionable habits and to approach relationships appropriately with our mission in life in mind. And then finally, after that, comes the step of attain, ultimately seeing that success in our lives, getting ready to meet Allah with everything that we've accomplished and continuing to improve our intentionality through our engagement with death, through our engagement with scripture, and through our engagement with mentors as well. So these are the four steps in the process. These four steps are, as I said, inspired by the formulations that are taken from our Islamic spiritual tradition. So this first step of ascertain alludes to the step of muraqaba or contemplation. Getting to know what's there inside and who our enemies are and all of that. Getting to know what our state really is. After that comes the process of takhliya, emptying ourselves out of the bad qualities that we had ascertained are inside of us. After takhliya can come tahliya. Now we've gotten rid of the bad qualities, so now it's time to take on good qualities inside of ourselves. And then once we've done that, we can have the tajliya, ultimately the manifesting uh, of that success and the kind of life that we really want to live. So this is the, the program. Now today, we won't have time to go through all steps of this program. But what we will take time for, inshallah, is to go through the first two, which are the most essential. So we'll be talking about number one, how to define your why. What does that mean and how can I tell that I've really found my why? And then number two, who are those enemies out to get my why? How do I understand them and ultimately defeat them? So, number one, defining your why. Before I get into the theoretical information I wanted to present in this first lesson, I want to bring us to another story. This isn't a personal one, this is a historical story. So the setting is 11th century in what is now northeastern Iran. The person in this story, the main character, his name is Muhammad ibn Muhammad. Now Muhammad ibn Muhammad is born into a poor family and his father dies when he's young. And so he and his brother Ahmed are left in the care of a local ascetic. Now that ascetic, being an ascetic, doesn't have many funds to provide for these boys. And so once the inheritance from their father runs out, he decides to enroll them in a local madrasa. Because at least the madrasa would provide them with food and shelter. Give them a general well-being general sustenance. And so they enroll in this madrasa ultimately out of poverty. But when they're in that madrasa, both Muhammad and Ahmad get a taste for Islamic knowledge. They actually like this and they're good at this. And so they start learning, they commit themselves to it. 
they increase in their knowledge. Eventually they graduate from that madrasa and move to another one, then to another, and they keep moving and graduating and increasing in their levels of Islamic knowledge and attainment until they reach finally the premier institution of the time, the Nizamiya, studying with the person understood to be the foremost scholar of the time, al Juwaini. And after that, Muhammad ibn Muhammad in particular, now not only a gifted student, but starts to clearly become a gifted teacher as well. And so he's around the Nizamiya and around attracts the attention of the leader at the time, Nizam al-Mulk, who sees his potential, sees the amazing gifts that this young man, Muhammad ibn Muhammad, now has, and appoints him to a professorship at the Nizamiya. So now here, here he is, starting out a life of poverty in an unknown place in northeastern Iran, outside of Tus. Now he's at the top institution of, uh, of the age, the top institution of that civilization at the time, having a top position. He's got the power, he's got the prestige, he's got that position, he has the money he needs, the clothes, the beauty all around him. People respect him, honor him. Outwardly, he has everything. But inwardly, something starts to affect him. You know, it starts with physical manifestations. He wakes up one day and he suddenly has a problem with his talking. He never had a stutter before. But now, he can't make it through a full lesson properly. He can't properly teach. With that comes a lack of enjoying his food. Food is tasteless to him. He can't really stomach anything, so he stops eating. He loses weight. He starts becoming really weak. And so the doctors come to him and try to figure out what's going on, and their assessment ultimately is, we can't find anything physically wrong with you. It must be spiritual. And now it starts to dawn on him. He starts to realize that there's something deeply bothering him. First of all, it's a question of, how do I know what I know? After reaching this pillar pinnacle of knowledge, how do I know that what I know is true? But even more than that, a question which burns even fiercer than that is, how do I know what I know about myself? Why am I here in this institution? What am I really about? And that starts to scare him. And now in this moment, he starts to hear several voices in his life, if you will. He describes it, he says that he becomes convinced that he is on the brink of a crumbling bank, about to fall into the fire. And what kind of voices did he start hearing? Well, for one, ahead of him, he describes a herald of faith calling him, saying, come, leave this life, work on yourself, step away from everything you've known, do something different. So there's a herald calling to him here, but then holding him back, as he says it, are the chains of everything that he's built and the power and prestige that he has pulling him back. And then next to him, speaking in his ear, is a shaitan saying, might sound like a good decision, but you're going to regret it if you step away from it. So he's hearing these voices, he's, he's, he's hearing that call, calling him to something else, but he's also feeling chained and he's getting convinced by, by this shaitanic voice. And so he wakes up in the morning committed, saying, yes, I'm, I, I'm on this brink, I need to do something. But then by the end of the day, he backs away and says, well, you know, I have a good life. Maybe that's an extreme decision. I can still do things. But he goes back and forth and back and forth. And this lasts for months until finally he decides, he says, I'm going to take this step. I'm stepping away from this life. He leaves his position. He leaves his teaching position to his brother Ahmed. He leaves his family in the care of the welfare of the state at the time, and he says to everyone around him, I'm going for Hajj, I'm going for the pilgrimage, so that they won't really question much about what he's doing, but he actually heads towards Damascus. And now, what does he do? He spends 10 years in solitude, contemplation, and he, as he describes it, spiritual warfare against himself. Some days, he said, he will 
head up to the minaret of the mosque, seclude himself inside the minaret the whole day in worship and contemplation. He does this kind of thing for 10 years. Until, after 10 years, he feels a pull inside of him. He feels a pull to go back to that life that he left. But now, as a different man. And so he heads back to the Nizamiya. He's only there for a short time because then he feels a pull to return to his hometown, establish a center of learning there, and write. And write he does. And write quite prolifically. In fact, one of the works that he wrote during that time becomes the most cited work of Islamic knowledge after the Quran and Hadith. Now this man, Muhammad ibn Muhammad, we typically know him by his last name, Al-Ghazali. And that book that he wrote that became so influential, Ihya Ulum al-Din, The Revival of the Religious Sciences. But it wasn't just that book which was a game changer. It was many books, almost a hundred books that he wrote. Each of them making a fundamental change in so many different sciences, not only Islamic sciences, but philosophy itself. Philosophy and theology writ large. Centuries later, there will be Christian thinkers in, in, in the West who take from his work in terms of his philosophical thought and theological thought and continue to do so. And so if we had seen him at that time at the end of his life, having gone through those 10 years of solitude and then coming back and being so prolific and so influential, if we would have seen him, we might have said, SubhanAllah, you're on fire. You're flying. And from this, from this story, and also reflecting on mine too and my own experience, one of the key lessons we get from this is that your unique why will give you the fuel to fly. Your unique why will give you the fuel to fly. Because it's interesting, Imam Ghazali, rahimahullah, may God have mercy on him, he had the what? He had the position, the prestige, that life, but that wasn't it for him. In fact, he had the sense that that was pulling him further and further into perdition, into disgrace at the end of the day. It wasn't even his how, because he learned how to be a good person, finally. He worked 10 years on that and developed the right adab that he hadn't had before, the right comportment, the right spiritual wayfaring. He worked on that how. But after working on that, he felt a pull back because he had a specific why. He had a mission to teach, to write, and to become one of the most influential scholars of our whole ummah. This is Imam al-Ghazali. And this is what we can draw from, from his life, the importance of having that why to drive us. And so, now comes the question of how do we find that why? Which you might be wondering. Well, for one, <clears throat> there are several people in our society at large who have actually been talking about this recently. So Simon Sinek came out with a book a few years ago called Start With Why. His TED talk of the same name is one of the most influential TED talks of all time. In that book, he talks about finding your why being a process of discovery, not invention. You don't come up with your why. You look into your life. You look into what Allah has planted in your heart and you find it out that way. And we know this from our tradition, ultimately, from our teachings. From hadith such as when the Prophet, peace be upon him, said, Kullun muyassurun lima khuliqala. That everyone finds easy the life for which they have been created. And so this is it. The image that I find the most helpful in this regard is the image of a well. I call it the why well. That we're looking, we're looking to find that source of groundwater, which once we hit it, will create a wellspring, a fountain that will come up that we can draw from and have this pure taste of something which will fuel our flight, fuel our flight to the skies. So, the question is now today, brothers and sisters, are you interested in finding that well? Should we go through some exercise? Because we could just end it now. I don't know, it's a... You know, it's a Saturday afternoon. I think the Warriors are playing. 
Well, we got the uh, 49ers against the Eagles today as well. Uh, uh, mashallah. Um, I don't know. Should we just stop it here? Or should we should we do some exercises? Okay. Okay. Mashallah. Well. Okay. Well, when it comes to finding our why, this process I like to call why dowsing, because just like before we had hydrogeologists, there were dowsers who used crystals or rods or some kind of twigs or sticks to, fight a tr to try to find groundwater. It was more of an art than a science. And so similarly, our process of finding our individual why, it, it's more of an art than a science. There's no specific process that you go through. Step A, then step B, and then you can tell that you found it. It's more like triangulation. So this is what we're going to go through in a moment ultimately trying to arrive at this question and ultimately maybe just starting the question of trying to find out what is your why? What is my why? And so in a moment we're going to break up into pairs so find someone else to, to work with next to you. If, you um, if people are already in pairs and you're a, an odd one out then join a group of two to make it a group of three. Um, for those online, uh, maybe you're watching with someone or can draw someone in in this conversation to uh, to have have this little back and forth with you for a moment. Uh, one of you at least should be a timekeeper. So we're going to take four and a half minutes for this exercise. That means that if you're a group of two, each person gets two minutes, 15 seconds. If you're a group of three, that's a minute and a half per person. And we're going to spend time on these questions. Now, um, as I give you these questions, um, it might be helpful uh, for you to see them here up on the slides. If it's helpful for you to have them on your device, I also have a QR code right here where, where you, can, you can get that QR code and, and see the PDF and, and get the questions on your, advice to, on your device to follow along with. So first of all, we're going to take 30 seconds, inshallah, uh, to, to read the questions and to start thinking about them, get our, our juices flowing as we start reflecting on this, and then we'll start the clock of the four and a half minutes. Okay. So this is the point of the program where I ask for a volunteer. <laughs> After the wide dowsing, once we kind of have a sense of, of what might be our why, then comes the quality tests. We have a Y quality test kit up here. There are six tests for us to go through. So I'm interested in a volunteer who wouldn't mind being in front of us for a, for a moment, in front of the audience for a moment, uh, who thinks they have a general sense, maybe a start on, on what that Y is uh, and wanting to test it out a bit. So can I get someone? All right. What's your name, brother? Uh, Omer. Omer. Mashallah. Nice to meet you, Omer. Wa alaikum salam. So I'm going to hand you this mic. Okay. So make sure to hold that up close to your face. You can take a seat. Does this sound good? Okay. I think so. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. So, Omer, uh, tell me, tell me about your why. My why. Um, <clears throat> currently, I'm in community college and you know navigating my education, but. My why is something I don't think I've properly defined yet. I, I think um, starting uh, in a couple steps, getting there, I would say is, um, you know, I really enjoy helping people. Mm. And I really enjoy, you know, um, I've been a counselor for MINA, which is Muslim Youth of North mm -hmm. America. And honestly, that was one of the defining moments for me is that, you know, I enjoy helping and, um, you know, just, just counseling and, and, and being there for other people and helping them you know, kind of be comfortable with their own skin and stuff like that, mm -hmm. which is funny because I'm not sure what I want to do yet, but I love helping people figure out what they want to do. Okay. Yeah. Okay, nice, nice. Well, you've got to start here. Yeah. Um, should we run through some of these Let's tests? Yeah. Will you? Okay. Um, so first is the motivation test. Um, so this one, the question for you now, for you to ask yourself is, does this why motivate me to wake up early, stay up late, and push through setbacks? What do you think of, of what you have so far of, of helping helping others do helping others do what they want to do? Yeah, mm -hmm. is that possible? Uh, I think definitely. I've yeah. I've always really enjoyed um, 
it's like a satisfying feeling, you know, helping other people get to where they need to be. And I think this is definitely, um, I definitely, uh, I guess, invest more time in other people than I do myself sometimes. Mm. And I think uh, this is a good thing and also maybe not a good thing. Right. A, not a good thing in terms of I can probably focus on myself a little bit more. Mm -hmm. But uh, a good thing in terms of, you know, I'm, uh, I'm motivated and I'm, and I'm willing to help other people. Okay. Yeah. Okay, nice. So do you feel like you passed this motivation test? I would say so. Okay, okay. Well, let's hear it from the audience. So I'm going to give a count of three. On the count of three, you either say pass, if you think that Brother Omer has passed, or you stay silent, okay? One, two, three. Pass. Okay, a little reluctant pass, sounds like. Okay, let's do the next one. Um, do you want to read this one, uniqueness test? Yeah, sure. Uh, uniqueness test. Is this why somewhat unique and original to me? Hmm. What do you think? I don't think it's original. Mm -hmm. um, I think other people love helping other people as well. Um, and that's an, that's an amazing thing. Mm -hmm. But I think um, it's very special to me. Mm. And I personally, you know, find a lot of satisfaction and um, just, you know, I'm very happy with, with this why in terms of helping other people. And stuff. Okay, okay. But maybe, you know, so, so this, this test, it's um, one thing about our why is it, it doesn't necessarily mean that no one else has it. Mm -hmm. That's not what the uniqueness test is about. But it has to be something that, that, that really is something that I feel called to do mm -hmm. and I see as, as something which I'm uniquely positioned to do a little bit more than others. And so, I, gaining a sense of uh, of confidence and, and self worth in that, yes. in terms of in terms of how I uniquely can contribute. Um, so it sounds like there might be just a bit more work to to yeah. define it because a lot of people want to help other people, or help yeah. other people achieve. So maybe a bit more work to do in that regard. Would you say Would you say that you passed this one or, or not? What do I you think, think you're right. I definitely could hone in on on why okay. it's unique to me a little bit more. Okay. Okay. Perfect. All right. Well, let's move on to the memorability test. Read that for us. Is this why simple, concise, and catchy enough for me to remember word for word and say aloud in under 10 seconds? Yeah. Is this why simple enough? I guess if I was to turn it into one sentence or ten mm -hmm. se less than 10 seconds, I would say uh, my goal is to help other people. Yeah. yeah. Two seconds. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Maybe I could uh, definitely, you know, uh, make it a little bit more you know, specialized or something uh -huh. like that. But I think for now that's a that's a good baseline. Okay. Do so you feel like you passed this test? I hope I did. Yeah, inshallah. <laughs> well, let's see. Let's see what the hope of the audience is too. Okay. One, two, three. Nice. Uh, a little lukewarm there. <laughs> sounded like okay. Um, what about the next one? The service test. Let's check that out. <clears throat> service test. Uh, does this why involve serving all humanity? rather than a select few people that I care about? Um, I would say yeah. Mm. This one, I'm confident in saying yes. I think any, anybody who needs, if I can offer my help to anybody who needs it, I'm willing to offer it. Okay, yeah. nice, yeah. Yeah, I would say so too. Ultimately, what this test is about is that sometimes our mission in life can be simply providing for my family. There's nothing wrong with that as long as there's an intentionality that that is behind that of how we see that providing for our family is also serving the rest of society because there's a way in which we can be focused on serving a particular set of people that becomes almost dependent on those, uh, on those people or um, doesn't really go beyond that, which is something which we, we want to interrogate. Right. Um, and so uh, that was my timer going off, signaling that if I keep you any, any longer, I might give you a stomach also <laughs> from being in front of everyone else. And anyway, let's give it up for Omer. I'm be there. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Omer. Thank you, Brother Zahir. here. am be there. So as I'm putting these chairs back, you can see the other two tests that we have. And once again, there'll be several points during the program where I'll put that QR code again, which has the key teaching slides from today. So uh, you don't have to feel like you have to furiously scribble all this down. You can, can get the, the slides on your device in a moment too. So this is it. 
And this is why I'm here, ultimately trying to press this point of I sincerely believe that each, each, if each and every one of us has a unique why, a unique mission in life, and we know that, and we're working towards that, and it fits those tests, and it's that pure water for us to drink from, that that will really create profound change in our lives, in our communities, in our society, once we're able to find that why well. But life brings us down. Life is heavy sometimes, and I, one of the things I want you to take away from this is as you're working on your why now, you've started reflecting on it, started doing a bit of why dowsing, as you reflect on it, in those times when life drags you down, let your why raise you up. Just like how I experienced it, being down in that moment in March of 2020, then working on that why, and, once again, and time and again then being able to pull myself back up as I continued to get better at defining what my life was about. And ultimately the reason why this works, if we've really found our why, is because your unique why will give you the fuel to fly. Now, that's our first lesson today. If I left you here, if I left you simply with this message, uh, I would be remiss. There's a little bit more to go through, because if I left you with this, you wouldn't necessarily fly. You wouldn't necessarily take off. Might be a little like booking a flight in February that has a layover in Chicago. It's probably going to snow. You're probably going to get stranded somewhere. You're probably going nowhere for a little while. So how do we actually get that? Where, if you will? Well, that's where lesson two comes into play. Understanding who wants to pull us down. What are the forces out there wanting to take us off of our why? And to illustrate this point at first, I would like to tell another story. So, one part of my why, I won't bore you with going through my why and, and the, the, the how that is, is around that, which is in lesson three, which we won't go, go through to, together, but that part of the program is about defining how that supports that why. Well, one part of my how which supports my why is in my life, I am working towards having a life partner who I'll share, share my life with. That's always been part of my how. And alhamdulillah, I feel very privileged and blessed to have a beautiful marriage now, more than 12 years, going on 13, alhamdulillah, with my loving wife, Sarah from Colorado. But before Sarah from Colorado, there was Sarah from Colorado. A different Sarah from Colorado. Now, let me give you a bit of background. So, as I've alluded to, I did not grow up Muslim. I did grow up, though, with this sense of wanting a life partner to spend my life with. So, before coming to Islam, that meant having a girlfriend. And alhamdulillah, Allah made me a pretty good dork in high school, so I wasn't cool enough to necessarily be successful in that regard. Alhamdulillah, Allah protected me. Even though I did work, right? It took work all that time, having to have the hair crop, the beard shaved, the, the shirt ironed, the unique cufflinks, the trousers nice and pressed, the belt that matched the watch band and the shoes, and then unique socks, all that put together to potentially get an hour of another woman's life with me. But then came Islam. I became Muslim about a month or two after becoming Muslim, my beloved Jordanian-American friend from Detroit, Muhammad, may Allah bless his soul, he broke the news to me. He was driving me back from the masjid one day, and he heard, now I was in college at the time, and I actually had a girlfriend. Alhamdulillah, Allah protected me from, uh, from wanting to get physically involved in that relationship. But he knew I had a girlfriend, and he broke the news to me. He turned to me and said, Hey man, you just got to be a player. You got to say that girl, girl, let's get married. And I thought to myself, okay, you and I have vastly different definitions of what the word player means. <laughs> and I also knew that he didn't understand how these relationships tend to go and how serious people are in your typical Western relationship. So I knew I had to cut that off, which I did. And now this brings me to a little while after that, I find myself 
in the Middle East, specifically in Alexandria, Egypt. Beautiful city, but also a foreign city, a lonely city for me. You see, I've always been a lonely person myself, being an only child raised mainly by a single mother. Growing up in the US, every time I'd return to the UK, people would identify me as an American by my accent. Every time I was in the US, people would, well, Americans aren't very good at identifying ac accents because they're not really good at geography. So I get things like, are you Swedish? <laughs> <laughs> so I grew up feeling lonely, but I was particularly lonely in Alexandria because I was on an Arabic program in a foreign country on my own with other American students, but we had a language pledge, so I was forced to speak only at a fifth grade level because that was about my proficiency in Arabic at the time. So feeling lonely on this program, also knowing, as I said, having spent these years growing up trying to find that life partner, doing everything I could externally to try to, 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 to get one hour, potentially, of, another, of a woman's life. Now the bar has been raised. It's not just about getting one hour, but getting a whole life from that woman to commit to. And so I knew I needed help. I knew I needed to step up. I knew I needed to up my game. And so ultimately came the ultimate game upper, Ramadan. During Ramadan, this is my Ramadan dua that year in Alexandria. Every single night, I prayed fervently to Allah. Ya Allah, grant me my soulmate. Every single night. Then Ramadan ended, and I met Sarah from Colorado, the other one. Now this Sarah from Colorado, I was interested in her and she was interested in me and, and we started thinking about spending the rest of our life together, started getting to know each other. Now the thing is, I was so focused on that dua that I had made. I was so focused on accomplishing that goal, checking that box in life of life partner checked off. I was so focused on that. I was so focused on it happening on my time. Right? Sometimes when we think about du'a, we almost think about Allah being a vending machine. Like, okay, I put the dollar in, I put the du'a out, Allah brings the du'a back to me, right? We want things on our own time sometimes. This is how we get. And this was how I was at that time. And also, I didn't necessarily feel inspired by that relationship, but I felt comfortable. I felt comfortable. And I felt finally someone's interested in me. So I need to be interested in them. And maybe there are parts of me that can kind of be sacrificed a bit on the altar of accomplishing this checkbox. And so I'm someone who, if you can't tell, I love engaging in religious knowledge and speaking about religion and Islam in particular. She didn't like that so much. She was religious somewhat, but she didn't really like talking about things. So I thought, okay, okay, I'll, I'll, kind, of, I'll kind of bottle that piece of myself up and put it away. I'll take that out. And then there was something else that didn't quite vibe with her. And so I said, okay, let me put that aside. So I was slowly emptying myself out, slowly becoming a shell of who I really was. So no wonder that when, we, when the program ended and we returned back to the U.S., and she ultimately decided that she no longer wanted to continue talking with me, continue being with me, she thought it was long distance. I thought the trek between Boston and Hanover, New Hampshire, two and a half bus ride. Come on, we can make it work. She disagreed. Alhamdulillah. But I remember that moment when she told me over the phone and she had the resolve that she didn't want to continue things. I was at Dartmouth in Hanover, New Hampshire, and I remember that moment in Novak Cafe. I remember standing there around lunchtime with all the buzz of all the people around me and all the smells of everyone getting their lunch and then all of the colorful drinks and posters on the wall. And with all that color, everything looked gray. And with all that noise and buzz, everything sounded muted. I felt empty. Of course I felt empty. 
I'd become a shell of what I had once been. And I had to recover. I had to put myself back again. So I actually joined a friend. I went to a monastery for spring break and picked up a few books, a few books of Islamic spirituality, Purification of the Heart by Sheikh Hamza Yusuf, uh, some books from the Baha'u'llah tradition. I started reading those books. I started engaging with that information. I started working on myself and regaining that sense of self and understanding who I was, who I really was. And so now, come a year or two later, I find myself back in the Middle East now. Excuse the fuzziness of the picture, this was all I could find. This is a picture of me in my apartment in Damascus, Syria, in early 2011. So it's winter in Damascus in 2011, so it's colder than it ever was in Alexandria. They don't really have central heating in Damascus. So it's cold, I'm alone in my apartment. I had an American roommate on my program. He had to leave abruptly. I'm lonely. I'm isolated. It's a tough program. And I have this thought. This thought comes into my mind of, I remember this young woman, Sarah from Colorado, different Sarah from Colorado now, I remember her from college. I remember her from the MSA. And she is the one woman I can think of in my life who I wouldn't change anything about her. I wouldn't change anything about me to think about spending the rest of my life with her. And I thought, that's a crazy thought. And I had an even crazier thought. I said, I'm going to write this Sarah from Colorado a letter. So I wrote it. It began something like, Dear Sarah, Assalamu Alaikum. You might be engaged in conversation with a brother now about marriage. If so, please ignore this message and I am very deeply happy for you and you don't have to read anything further. But if not, I would like you to read as I tell you and write to you everything that I admire about you and makes me want to consider spending the rest of my life with you. And you know the crazier thing? She responded. Within a few days, we were talking on the phone. Within a few hours of conversation, first with her and then her father, we were both convinced that we wanted to get married. Within a few months, we were married. And now it's been over 12 years. Alhamdulillah. Now, what do I take from that? Well, in my life with Sarah from Colorado, and Sarah from Colorado. It was almost as if Allah was teaching me, calling my attention to compare these two situations. One in which I had compromised myself. I had let myself, I had had a certain sense of why and how in my life, but I let myself get pulled away from it. And another one in which I didn't feel the need to compromise anymore. I could be completely myself and let her be completely herself and things have worked out amazingly since. And so what I take from this in particular, and especially as I went through that process of reading works of Islamic spirituality, is the lesson that if you don't learn to defend your why, it will be taken from you. We have to understand who our enemies out there and we have to take them seriously. This isn't a game. They're not playing. Now how do we do that? Well. Okay, so pop quiz. I know this has been mentioned in this, in this community. I know people have mentioned this on, on the mimba. Uh, you have heard this at some point, likely. At least many of you. So let me put you on the spot. Can anyone say, who are your four enemies in life? You can just call it out. Uh, what, okay, so shaitan's one of them. Great. Who else? So, and there's nafs. Right, ego. What else do we have? Arrogance, okay, that's, a, a, that's not necessarily an enemy, but it's, it's something your enemies can do to you. You can fall into its equality. Sorry? Hawa, right. Whim, caprice. What else? Dunya, there we go, there we go. 
dunya, the material world. Those are our four enemies. I, I even remember, I remember a talk from Sheikh Hamza Yusuf. It's always been drilled in my head, those four words. Nafs hawa shaitan dunya, nafs hawa shaitan dunya, nafs hawa shaitan dunya. Anyway, to make this a little more practical and, and actionable in our lives, I find it helpful to use this acronym, FOES, to remember our four enemies and to think about how they actually manifest in our life. So the F stands for feelings. So as you can see, as we'll see in the picture with each foe, ultimately each foe has a little vial of poison that they want to dump into your Y well, infect that with their poison so that rather than serving your Y, you're serving their purposes. These are the foes that want to take your Y away from you and have you serve them. So, what is feelings about? Well, this is my translation of Hawa, the Islamic concept of whim. What do I mean by feelings? Well, what I don't mean is your sensations, your felt wisdom, that wisdom that comes from, from your feeling things in life. What I do mean is feeling good. Feelings is about feeling good. Physically, right, being comfortable, having a nice comfy seat, mashallah, a nice rug under me. Not only physical comfort though, but emotional, mental comfort as well. Not being offended, not being challenged, wanting a trigger warning. Oh no, please don't, don't bother me. You know, if we have a need for trigger warnings, ultimately, that's a serious thing, but ultimately that means we have some trauma in our lives which is our responsibility to start working on. Taking responsibility for that. Feelings is all about not taking responsibility. Don't challenge me, just leave me alone. I just want to feel comfortable, I want to feel good, and I also want to feel how I feel comfortable feeling. We each have default personalities. We're an introvert or an extrovert. We like being people with people or we, do, or we don't. We're systematic or we're haphazard, and we get challenged in that way Feelings comes up and says, oh, this is making me a little uncomfortable and I don't like that. And so I find it very helpful to engage with a lot of the different personality typing models that are out there because <clears throat> it can really teach us what our hawa is going to call us to when we understand our personality typing. My favorite one I find the most wisdom in is called the Enneagram. Has anyone here heard of the Enneagram at all? Okay, we got maybe one or two. Okay, um, I highly recommend looking into the Enneagram. I have a book recommendation for you, The Road Back to You. I find the Enneagram the most beneficial because it's built on the sense that we have basically three primary, three potential ways that we can respond to pain in the world. We either get sad, we get mad, or we go to dad because we're scared. And of those three emotions, we have three things we can do with those emotions. We either internalize those emotions, we bring them in upon ourselves, or we externalize them. We put them upon other people, or we vaporize. We completely run from them. We don't want to hear about them. And so me, for example, I'm a one on the Enneagram. I'm a perfectionist. The thing about perfectionists is they're motivated by anger, ultimately. I'm angry about the world, but what do I do with that anger? I internalize it. So when I see something wrong in the world, I think, I'm angry at myself for not dealing with that. That can cripple me if I'm not aware of it. All of these, the, there's, there's always a strength to this emotion, but a, a negative to it as well, because ultimately all three of these emotions, they're real, and they're real human emotions that we should be feeling, but ultimately, they, are, they have to be a function of love at the end of the day. Anyway, that's kind of an aside and a recommendation uh, from me. But getting back to feelings, what feelings whispers to us, what it keeps saying inside of us, that voice that we hear inside of ourselves is the voice that says, I just want to be free and take a break. And that's appealing because of course we want to be free. Of course we want to feel good. We were built to be free, actually. That's how Allah built us. But a freedom, which is freedom from everything except our slavehood to Allah. That's the catch. And so, 
It's appealing, but the way that we dismiss that whisper that feelings put, puts inside of us is by giving it back the whole truth, which shatters that partial truth of, well, true, you're true, we want freedom, but true freedom comes from true servitude. And ultimately, true servitude is true love. And if you really want to be comfortable, you need to be comfortable with being uncomfortable. That's the only true comfort we can have in this world. So that's feelings. Next, the O is outcomes. Now this is my rough translation of dunya, or the material world. Literally in Arabic, that which is nearest and closest to you. Now the thing about dunya and outcomes is that, so what I'm talking about here is accomplishing things. It's about the check boxes. It's about the specific things that we either have or haven't done. And the thing about checking boxes is that it very easily leads to comparison. If I check that box of getting that job, it means a bunch of other people haven't checked that box because they didn't get that job. Or even if it's a checkbox that everyone could have still, if I know that I've done it, then I know that other people have or haven't done it, and it very easily lends itself towards comparison. Now, interestingly enough, <clears throat> if you go full circle the other way, it actually becomes the same thing. So outcomes is also about lack of accomplishment. If we're not focused on getting certain things done in life, that, that's, that's an ultimate accomplishment. The person who's lazy in life wants to be ultimately lazy and completely disregard any kind of external success at all. That's part of the dunya as well. So we're not talking about being inattentive to accomplishment and to check boxes. Once again, if we remember, and if we saw on the slide that we went through quickly, one of those why quality tests is the generative test. Does this why generate things for me to do and to accomplish in life? So we do want to be attentive to that, but not in a way that distracts us. As Simon Sinek, that author of Start With Why, has said, success is the most dangerous foe of true accomplishment. Broad paraphrase. But ultimately he says, and he's talking, he talks about it in the context of companies. Companies that become really successful, they just become distracted by their own success. Distracted by those check boxes and those metrics. Allah alludes to this in the Quran. When he says, He says, We grant the home in the hereafter to those who do not seek superiority. The happy ending is awarded to those who are mindful of God, the people of taqwa, muttaqin. So those who do not seek superiority, those who aren't comparing themselves to someone else and saying, I'm better than that. I'm better than Ahmad. I'm better than Fatima. Alhamdulillah. No, that's not the point. What's the paradigm of success? Allah links success in the Quran to belief to faith, to Iman. It's interesting that Allah doesn't say at the beginning of Surah 23, قَدْ أَفْلَحَ muslimun. He doesn't say the people of Islam, the Muslims have succeeded. He says the people of Iman, of faith have succeeded. Because success must be for us an intangible thing. Just like how Iman is intangible. Islam is not intangible. Islam, five pillars, that's the actions, those are the physical actions that we're required to do. But our tradition is not just about Islam. There are three dimensions to our tradition. Our deen is Islam, it's Iman, and it's Ihsan. It's body, it's mind, and it's heart. And so the true test is ultimately what's happening on the inside, and ultimately no one else can tell that. You can't tell the difference on the outside between a hypocrite and a true believer. So similarly, this is intangible, but also similarly, your practice of Islam and you're actually doing the things that you can check boxes on. Have I prayed Doha? Did I fast properly during Ramadan? Those are signals of your Iman. Similarly, the accomplishments can be signals of your attentiveness to overall success. And many different references we could give in this regard, but also just want to call attention the famous hadith 
that many of us, I'm sure, are aware of. إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَاتِ وَإِنَّمَا لِكُلِّ مَنْ مَعْلَوَى That actions are based only on intentions. This is the Arabic. إِنَّمَا which it starts with in the Arabic means actions are based only on intentions and nothing else. Everyone has exactly what they intended. Ultimately, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter whether you succeeded or not. But your success should be for you a signal of, did you have the right intentions? That, could cause, that should cause you to ask the question. But ultimately, that's not what it's about. It's about those intentions. And so outcomes is not about that. It's about the checkboxes, the specific things. It's about the comparison. And it says inside of us, it's telling us, we hear that voice, I need to know that I'm valuable and that I'm better than others and I need to know it now. And that appeals to us. Because of course we want to feel good about ourselves again. We want to feel successful. We want to know that we're doing the right thing. But ultimately, we have to respond with the whole truth that our value must be internally validated. It will be externally validated in the Akhirah, at the end of time. But right now it has to be internally validated and will have to continue to unfold. And the only true comparison is comparing myself today to myself yesterday and seeing have I improved or not. So that's outcomes. The E in foes is for ego. Right, nafs, exactly. So what this is about is not your ego in terms of yourself, your individuality, what makes you, you. Sometimes we actually get into problematic relationships when we sacrifice what we're really about, as in my case. So that's not what we're speaking about. What we're speaking about is that ego that calls to being filled. Fill me up. It wants to be filled with food, filled with drink, filled with carnal pleasure, with intimacy, all of these things. And it also wants my way wants to do things my way. Not only does it want to be filled, but it wants to fill all of existence. It wants to look out at the world and see everything and know what everything out there, what all those people out there are doing for me. It wants to imprint its own self upon everything that exists. And the only way to dispel that in us because, of course, once again, we want to feel good. We want to feel filled. But ultimately, what kind of filling is that? Well, it's being fulfilled. And when we look at the world, we want to look at it and see, how can I contribute to everything that I'm seeing? How can I do better for this person in my life and for this thing happening and that in the world? So that's ego. And then finally, the S stands for Satan. Yeah, in the Muslim context, I'm sure most of us are familiar with this concept of shaitan and, and, and Satan and the personification of this, of this force. Um, I find it helpful, though, in case people find that's too religious or something, maybe in another context, because ultimately I'm building this, I've built this material not just to suit a Muslim context, but to be beneficial in general and to, for us to be able to share with our non-Muslim friends, family, colleagues. Um, also, another way to look at this foe is our shadow side, almost the inverse of us. Uh, we have, at the end of time, we're told there's going to be the Christ comes, Isa alayhi salam, may Allah make us amongst his party. And there's also, there's going to be the Christ and the Antichrist, right. And so, similarly, we have a why. Well, this is your anti-why. It's shaitan. Shaitan is all about calling you to moral failure, calling you to do things that you know to be wrong. But if they're not kind of universally known to be wrong, at the very least, he wants, you, he wants to call you to things that you know are beneath you, things you shouldn't be involved in. Now, interestingly enough, sometimes we confuse this, especially if we don't have a religious perspective, with what the government says is wrong or with what society says is wrong. But often, when we're really true to our why, it will be misunderstood. Other people will think it's a bad idea. And so that's not what we're talking about. It's ultimately that sense inside of us that we're doing the right thing. That's what we want to be on. And the inverse of that, the shadow of that, is doing the wrong thing. And so what this shadow, what this shaitan, this Satan, wants to tell us and is whispering in us is saying, you hear this voice in yourself, I'm a danger. 
to self and others, and I am destined for an epic fail. I'm, I'm pretty bad, and I'm about to mess up seriously. That's what shaitan wants for you, ultimately. He wants you to be crippled by the thought, not necessarily even engaging in bad activity, but he wants you to be so obsessed with the fear that you might get engaged in something that you, you shouldn't be engaged in, that it cripples you, it paralyzes you, it causes you not to take a bold move. Because the fact is, with a bold move, just with Imam al-Ghazali being on that precipice and hearing the call to faith, and then shaitan whispering in his ear and saying, you're going to regret that decision. What Imam al-Ghazali was feeling was the pull of a leap of faith. And the thing about a leap of faith is that in the middle of it, it feels like falling. Shaitan wants us to feel like we're about to fall. But actually that can be a sense that we're actually taking a leap of faith, we're stepping into a deeper sense of purpose. And so the only way to respond to that is to understand that, that things in the world that have dangerous potential in creation also have the potential for amazing good. And so true, the human is weak, the human has a capacity for immense evil, but that actually only signals the human's capacity for immense good, which even outpaces that evil. <clears throat> so those are the foes, there we have them, feelings, outcomes, ego, and Satan. And one final note to make about all of these foes is that these are internal to us, but since they're internal to you, they're external, they're internal to everyone else, and hence they're also external enemies as well. Other people can be, can represent these enemies in your life, can fall into these patterns for you. And this, there are many allusions in Quran to this. One of the most, one of the allusions we might be the most familiar with is from the last surah of Quran, where Allah warns us against the shaitan against the Satans that come from both jinn kind, both the unseen forces and humankind. So, internal and external. These are your foes. And these, if you were to look at that story of the Sarah from Colorado versus the Sarah from Colorado, you'll see in my story, in that first instance, all four of those foes pulling me away from who I felt like I really needed to be. But, interestingly, in that story, if you remember, when I finally realized that and was confronted with not being able to be with that first Sarah from Colorado, it gave me an opportunity. Which is why one of the key lessons I want you to take away from, from our time today is to take setbacks in the pursuit of your why as reminders to check for your foe's poisons. Because we can't always have that awareness. We can't always be completely on point and on message and being aware of what those whispers are. But what we can do is when the tough times come, when the affliction hits, when things are hard for us, that can be that signal for us. Oh, maybe I'm, maybe I'm not fully on my way. If I'm, not, if I'm feeling dragged down now, I'm not feeling like flying, it's not pushing me through these setbacks, maybe I need to reorient myself and check, have some foes snuck into my Y well and dump some poison in there, which I'm potentially drinking from. So now um, we have the potential to do an exercise. I think, I think for the, the sake of time, um, we're just gonna, uh, we're gonna skip this particular exercise, but you can uh, take a look at this on your own time. Once again, on, uh, on the slides, I have the QR code again here. This will be um, here at the end of the presentation for, for you to follow as well. I just wanted to put up on, on the slide some signs that your why has been poisoned, some things to reflect upon in regards to all, all four of these foes. So, this is what we've covered today. I've thrown a lot at you. You might be thinking, okay, okay, so I've learned, learned why it's important to define my why. I've started that a bit. I've learned a bit about who my enemies are and how to think about how they might take me off my why. 
Now, what's the next step? Because Adnan up front told us that there are other steps in this process. Well, what do I do now? Because our time together today is gradually coming to a close. Um, well, if you are, are interested in the rest of this material, um, we have a website, fightforyourwhy.com. There's not a lot up on that now, but at the very least, there's a why muscle strengths test that you can take to, to see how strong are you in defending your why. Uh, and also, too, um, there's a, a link to set up a, a call with me. I'd like to, I'd love to make some time with you uh, to, to think through this with you, uh, help you think through, through your why. Um, and, and also, um, if you want the, the rest of the content from, uh, from this method. So with that being said, I want to end on a final story. The setting for this one. A moment ago, I told the story about Muhammad ibn Muhammad. And this story is about Muhammad ibn Abdullah, the Prophet, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Peace and prayers be upon him. The time of this story is the eleventh year after his prophecy becoming manifest. He's fifty-one years old. What state is he in? I want you to think about what he's feeling at this time. He's gone through three years of a Muslim ban. Ban against the Muslims. The whole Muslim community is ostracized in Mecca. No one can trade with them. No one can even associate with them. Through that time and through that hardship, three years of a boycott, that takes a toll on the community. That inflicts hunger, it inflicts poverty, it inflicts immense hardship on that community. People are lost, including some of the most beloved people to the Prophet He loses his beloved uncle, Abu Talib. He loses his beloved wife, Khadija, the first Muslim, the woman who was there for, with him, for him, at the very beginning. So here he is, sitting with the hunger, the hardship, the cold of the night, sitting with the pain of that loss of his beloveds, and the pain too, the knowledge that the mission which he's living out has caused pain to people that he's loved. Imagine what he must be sitting with in that moment, the loneliness, the isolation. Then what happens? Well. One night, he meets a new friend. His friend, the angel of revelation, Jibril, comes to him with a new character this time, named Burak, a magnificent creature that can traverse from this point to as far as the eye can see in one bound. And the prophet, peace be upon him, he gets on this creature and rides it all the way to Jerusalem. And what does he find there? Company. Friends, other messengers and prophets. He has spiritual communion with them. He prays with them. Imagine how that must feel after a life of, after all these years of hardship and hunger and cold and isolation and loneliness, now being with his crew, if you will. Of course, the Sahaba is his, is his crew, but he also his crew, the messengers. No one can relate, no one else can relate to him on that level. He gets companionship with them. After that, brought up through the seven heavens, gets to meet the denizens of hell, the denizens of heaven, and ultimately ascending to the presence of Allah himself. Now imagine what that must have felt like, what he experienced in Allah's presence, compared to what he'd been going through in that cold night in Mecca. Imagine the warmth of that presence, the mercy, the love, the understanding, the companionship, the sense of place, the sense of arrival, the openness, the expansion. If you were in that place, I wonder what you would do. Because I feel like I know what I would do. I just want to stay there. I would just want to stay in that presence. <laughs> Forget the cold. Forget the loneliness, forget all that hardship. Let me just stay here, enjoy this the rest of my days. But what happens? He goes back. He comes back. 
comes back to the cold, to the loneliness, to the hardship. He comes back to his why. He comes back to his mission. Now, it's interesting because the next day, in the morning, people start hearing about this story. The Muslims of the time actually had a hard time, many of them at first, believing that this actually happened. And so, I don't know where everyone in this space and online is in regards to that story. I myself have full conviction that this actually happened. Alhamdulillah. But I don't know where you are. Maybe you just see it as allegorical. But the fact is undeniable that this is a key, this is a key story in the Islamic tradition, a key part of human civilization. And so the question is, why is this story so foundational for our civilization? It's so foundational because it signals, deep down we know, the potential that each and every one of us has. To go through and sit through the hardship, the loss, the affliction, the pain, the cold, because we know exactly what we're about. Just like the Prophet did, peace be upon him. That is our example. That is our message, that is our potential, and that is what I hope for myself and hope for all of you. Because this time is ending now, our time together. We'll soon be going back to whatever's outside, whatever's waiting for us outside of the mosque, right? We've got our deadlines, we've got our financial pressures, we've got our health concerns, we've got, we got bills to pay, we've got our messy relationships, the conflict that hasn't quite been sorted out yet, we're returning back to that cold night. And the question is, are we going to return back the same or are we going to return back different? Are we going to embrace that struggle and see it as the Prophet وسلم, saw it as ultimately not seeing the hardship but seeing the hardship as ultimately a function of even a more immense mercy. That's my hope for you and for myself. And with that, we'll end on dua. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala Ali Sayyidina Muhammad. Allahumma farraj anin Muslim yani mukulli makan. Allahumma aslih ummati Muhammadin sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allahumma farraj an ummati Muhammadin sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allahumma arham ummati Muhammadin sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ya Allah, please. Rectify the Ummah of your beloved Prophet, peace be upon him. Ya Allah, please grant, uh, grant relief to the Ummah of your beloved Prophet, peace be upon him. Ya Allah, please grant mercy to the Ummah of your beloved Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ya Allah, allow what we've learnt today and what we've thought about today to be the beginning of something powerful, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, allow us to actualize our service to you by actualizing our service to others. Ya Allah, Allahumma haqq islamana wa imanana wa ihsanana. Ya Allah, please re allow us to realize true Islam, true Iman, true Ihsan. Ya Allah, please guide us in terms of a specific guidance that shows all of us exactly how we can serve you and serve our fellow humans, Ya Allah. Please grant us success in that, Ya Allah. Wa akhiru da'wana. And alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun. Wa salamu ala al-mursaleen. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Thank you. Okay. Well, Jazakumal Khair, this was really, really wonderful. Um, I just had a quick clarification. The internalized, externalized, and vaporized, the way, three ways of responding to mm. pain. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could explain what does that actually look like? I think you described internalizing, mm. but what, mm -hmm. I mean, what does it look like to externalize? Yeah, yeah. For, for that, I would, I, would encourage, um, I would encourage looking into a resource like that book, The Road Back to You. I found it very helpful. Um, the Enneagram of Personality not only helps us understand what our default personality tends to be, but what we, what we start to look like under stress and um, in the good times as well, when our personalities can shift. Um, and um, so maybe to illustrate, I can talk about the, uh, what's called the anger triad, which is the triad which I'm part of, the three personalities based on anger ultimately. So as I mentioned, I'm, I'm a perfectionist. Uh, my response to the anger that I feel deep inside. First of all, before I read the Enneagram, I would literally say throughout my life, oh, I don't get angry. I don't get angry. And that's a key marker of a, of a one, of a perfectionist. Because for them, anger is some... A perfectionist like me, I'm angry about the fact that I'm angry inside. 
<laughs> so I deny that I'm angry because anger is a negative emotion for me. So I want to deny that I'm feeling angry at all, even though that is ultimately what motivates me. So I internalize that anger. I get angry at myself for not doing things and for falling short and that kind of thing. That's what makes a perfectionist. Now, the, another way to respond is to externalize it. And that's what, um, that's what makes a challenger which is an eight on the Enneagram. A challenger is the kind of person who doesn't want to be controlled by anyone else, wants to be a trailblazer and do things, and they're actually often great influencers in society. So these are, these are not negative things. Um, these are, um, every, every strength has a shadow, uh, as, as is said. So every personality has pros and cons. So the best example for me of an eight actually is Sheikh Hamza. Um, he, if anyone's had experience with him, he's a very intimidating personality in a good way. Like, he's done so much for our community, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf, um, done so much in community because he has a clear vision and because he doesn't mind telling it like it is <laughs> and he's not going to be controlled and swayed by anyone else. Um, he, to me, is a key example of, uh, of a, a number of an eight. Um, a nine, who is the other person motivated by anger, is the person who runs from that anger. And a nine is the peacemaker, a person who is really disturbed by anger because that's ultimately what they feel inside. So the kind of person who is always obsessed about uh, not having conflict, resolving conflict really quickly or brushing over it because it really upsets them that people might be angry at, at each other. That's a beautiful thing to seek to reconcile between people, but it also can become, can become a dangerous thing when we don't want to deal with conflict or want to pretend like conflict is not going on. Does that help in that regard? Subhanakallahumma bi bihamdik, ashhadu an la ilaha illa ant, astaghfiruka wa atubu ilaik. Thank you. Jazakumullah.